We should think of gold not as an investment, but as a form of money. So what you, you know, the savings you um, used to keep in dollars ought to be in gold now, because gold is a form of money that's going to hold its value while the dollar is inevitably inflated away. And uh, what's, what's happening in China now is is interesting because they have capital controls. Their people aren't allowed to, to for instance, buy things overseas um, in, at scale. And there's a lot of things they can't invest in domestically, but they're allowed to invest in gold. And they are worried about what's going to happen to their economy. So they're buying gold as a form of insurance against the crisis that they see coming in their currency and in their financial system. We should have that same attitude. After a period of stagnation, gold has surged into the next phase of its bull market. While some inexperienced investors may be tempted to cash in on recent gains, such a move could have negative consequences in the long term. The precious metal's recent breakout can be attributed to higher-than-expected inflation in the United States and widespread concerns spanning from geopolitics to the November presidential elections, as well as uncertainty surrounding monetary policy and markets. Former Wall Street financial analyst John Rubino sheds light on the intricate dynamics shaping the gold markets, drawing from his expertise as a technical analyst. Rubino highlights the repercussions of abandoning the gold standard, particularly the resulting debt issues. Recent projections from the Congressional Budget Office indicate that U.S. debt could reach 99% of gross domestic product by the year's end, with a trajectory towards 172% by 2054. Such a scenario could trigger inflation through monetization, financial repression, and market turmoil, circumstances where gold tends to shine. Rubino advocates for a strategic shift away from the dollar towards gold for savings, citing its resilience against anticipated inflation. He also emphasizes China's adoption of gold as an insurance policy amidst economic turbulence, signaling a noteworthy strategy. Chinese buyers, unnerved by a prolonged property slump, are turning to gold, recognizing its value as a hedge against uncertainty. As economic uncertainty looms, spurred by a recent stock market downturn, investors are flocking towards gold, igniting a global surge in bullion demand. According to the state-backed China Gold Association, gold consumption in China spiked by 5.94% year-on-year to reach 308.91 tons in the first quarter. Simultaneously, China's imports of gold raw materials surged by a staggering 78% during the same period, contributing to a remarkable 21.16% increase in the country's total gold output. With a forward-thinking perspective, Rubino advocates for physical precious metals as cornerstone assets, along with ventures into sectors like mining stocks. Business Insider reports that in March 2024, gold miners experienced their most robust performance in a year, surpassing even the semiconductor industry. Despite this, physical gold has consistently outperformed shares of gold mining companies over the past three years by one of the largest margins in decades. Stay tuned as we present excerpts from John Rubino's recent interview on natural resource stocks. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates as we continue our discussion. Where we are now is the result of an experiment that we started in 1971 with fiat currencies, where we basically did away with the backing of the world's major currencies, took gold out of the equation, um, and gave the big governments a, an effectively unlimited credit card. And, you know, human nature being what it is, they've abused that privilege to the point where everybody at every level in every major country is wildly over indebted, which means we're, we're pretty much guaranteed chaos going forward. And the, uh, the nature of chaos is that it's not predictable in, in its specifics, but in kind of a broad brush analysis, it's very predictable. You know, wild, crazy things are going to happen when the various bubbles start blowing up. And, uh, and Bob is exactly right. We need protection from the chaos. And that should be kind of the, the overriding investment pieces here is what can we do to make ourselves resilient and um, to an extent impervious to financial crises? Because that's what we've got coming our way in one way or another. We should think of gold not as an investment, but as a form of money. So what you, you know, the savings you um, used to keep in dollars ought to be in gold now, because gold is a form of money that's going to hold its value while the dollar is inevitably inflated away. And uh, what's, what's happening in China now is, is interesting because they have capital controls. Their people aren't allowed to, to for instance, buy things overseas um, in, at scale. 
And there's a lot of things they can't invest in domestically, but they're allowed to invest in gold. And they are worried about what's going to happen to their economy. So they're buying gold as a form of insurance against the crisis that they see coming in their currency and in their financial system. We should have that same attitude here, you know. So, you know, the gold bug attitude over the last 30 years of, of buying has, has served them pretty well, I think, now, because now they've got big stacks of gold and silver. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't think we should, um, you know, have any kind of a religious attitude about any one asset. And I think the different variations in the precious metal space are, it, you know, account for different... Um, points of view. For instance, you want precious metals, physical, uh, where you can reach them uh, as your replaced currency. That's your, the base money in your financial life. And then from there, you can branch out into other precious metals related things like the mining stocks, which are, they're investments, they're not money, but they're potentially really lucrative investments. So um, you can stay kind of within the, um, the hard asset space where there's land and there's precious metals and there's some other commodity investments <clears throat> with your whole financial life. You know, you could build a portfolio that basically just covers the um, hard asset, the real asset waterfront. Those are things that governments can't create more of on electronic printing presses. And you can be pretty in pretty good shape financially if you do that because you'll be owning things that will tend to do all right in the kind of crisis that's probably coming. And that's the intellectual challenge. How do you want to set your portfolio up so that it's mostly in real assets? And, um, you know, which copper companies do you choose to invest in? Which gold miners, things like that. There's a lot to think about, but it's, you know, it's containable. You, you can, uh, a regular person can learn enough to be able to do that. And I think that's what we should all mostly be doing now. Despite historically low interest rates over the past decade, Rubino issues a stark warning about an impending crisis in commercial real estate. He anticipates potential challenges in refinancing as interest rates rise. Rubino predicts that upcoming debt maturities may act as a trigger for a banking crisis, necessitating government bailouts and shaking currency confidence. Notably, over half of the world's foreign currency reserves are denominated in US dollars. Any sudden devaluation of the dollar could have far-reaching consequences affecting the market for treasuries as well as heavily indebted lower-income countries struggling to meet sovereign debt obligations. This could potentially tip some emerging economies into debt or political turmoil. Rubino also highlights the uncertainty of the near-term economic outlook characterized by conflicting inflationary and deflationary pressures. He stresses the importance for individuals to prepare for these potential crises as significant challenges loom on the horizon. Let's get back to the interview. So we had a naturally low interest rates. And so a lot of commercial real estate in particular um, got planned and designed and built using really cheap financing. Well, now a lot of those debts are coming due now. And there's no way um, a, a big chunk of the country's office buildings are still financially viable if they have to refinance at today's interest rates. So you're seeing, you know, every two weeks or so, there's a story about some $180 million office building that sold for $12 million or something like that. Well, now that means there are embedded losses in commercial real estate. And um, somebody has to take those losses. And a lot of that bad paper is on the balance sheets of local and regional banks. So in the year ahead, well, actually it's an ongoing thing. It's happening now, but in the year ahead, it's going to get worse. Uh, a lot of local and regional banks are going to have to report those losses. And that's going to spook their depositors into pulling money out, uh, which forces them to sell some of those, those depreciated assets and take even bigger losses and so on until the banks start to fail. Then uh, that spreads through the sector. The U.S. government has to step in and bail them out. And then that shifts the, uh, potentially, it shifts the pressure over to the currencies because, you know, who wants to own the currency of a country that's doing yet another multi-trillion dollar bailout? So that, that might be the story of the next year where, um, you know, banking crisis leads to some kind of a broader crisis in the financial market. So I have no idea what's going to happen in the next few weeks or, or a few months. But the, the big picture is kind of baked into the cake. You know, we borrowed way too much money. Uh, and in order to finance all this debt, we have to create enough currency that's going to devalue the currency in some fundamental way. So that's, that's the, um, the overarching thing. Now, in the short run now, we, we've got cross currents especially in the U.S. economy, where 
Um, on the one hand, the, the U.S. government is running massive deficits. We're at a, like a trillion five a year right now, heading for two trillion. And that's very stimulative because they're just making money out of thin air and dumping it into the banking system. On the other hand, you've got all this debt out there that is being repriced and spiking everybody's interest costs. So personal interest expense, which is what you know we, we three and everybody else has to pay on our debts is going straight up. And the government's interest expense is going straight up too. Um, and those are, are fundamentally deflationary because they, um, they, they make it hard to pay off debts and lead to defaults. So we've got this kind of, you know, this mountain of bad paper, which is very deflationary out there. And we've got a, a government that's just running massive deficits, which is inflationary. And so that's why we got this kind of uh, stasis economy right now, where inflation is above the Fed's targets and it's not going down. Um, but the, the economy is, uh, you know, it's, it's providing mostly enough jobs for people, but there are more and more layoffs out there at the same time and more and more defaults on credit cards will probably win. And, you know, I have no idea which one it'll be in the next year or two, but we either have kind of deflationary crash like in, in 2008, or we have rising inflation and then we get the 1970s on steroids. And I honestly don't know which one it's going to be, you know. It seems like it could be either, depending on the decisions that are made going forward. That's why we should all be trying to protect ourselves as best we can against some kind of crisis, because something is definitely coming. Despite the departure from the gold standard years ago, gold prices have remained significantly influenced by central bank actions. While Western central banks may not prioritize gold prices in their currencies, they do exert control over factors that impact gold prices, such as central bank net purchases or sales real interest rate expectations and longer dated energy prices, given the growing volatility in the global economy, how do you plan to safeguard your investments against currency? Devaluation and financial instability? Drop your thoughts in the comment section below. If you find this video informative, don't forget to support our channel and turn on notifications to stay informed about our latest videos. See you in the next video.